<laughs> Russ Barkley here. Happy Halloween. In this episode, we're going to talk about neurofeedback for ADHD. But before that, let me get this ridiculous mask off. Give me just a second. All right. There we have it. Let me get my disheveled appearance back. And we'll send our Halloween lecture on whether or not neurofeedback is effective for ADHD. Let's understand this is a very controversial topic. It has been since the 1970s. Opinions go one way or another. Some studies suggest maybe it works. Uh, other studies suggest that depends on how you measure it. Some studies suggest it depends on which kind of neurofeedback you're doing. Uh, and there are a number of different meta-analyses of the data that have reached uh, different conclusions, some concluding it's helpful, uh, others looking at the more rigorous research saying that it is of no greater benefit when you compare it to active control groups that are getting sham treatment. So let's have a look through the literature. Uh, you're probably going to wind up having to reach your own opinion about this. I have mine. In case you're not familiar with EEG neurofeedback, uh, basically it involves placing electrodes over the scalp, either individually, which in the early days was done using a sort of adhesive on the scalp. Uh, later on, we have these sort of webs or caps some people use a band around the head as well. Uh, but all of them are intended to do one thing, and that is to measure the different bands of electrical activity in the EEG, feed this in to a device that visualizes those different bandwidths, as you see here, and then feed that over typically into a game not always, but most of the time, where the individual is asked to play this game and find ways to improve their performance. It can be flying a rocket ship or a jet at different altitudes. Uh, the higher it goes, the better you are at controlling your uh, brain activity, usually the beta wave activity, and lowering the theta activity, which is the more slow wave activity. Uh, in others, it may involve rolling a ball up a hill. In some, they don't even have a game. They just ask you to concentrate on something, usually an object. And we know that when you visualize something in your mind and you concentrate, it increases certain bandwidths of the EEG electrical activity. Now, research has shown that individuals with ADHD may often have a significantly different ratio of their theta wave, the slow wave activity associated with inattention, relative to the beta wave activity, which is associated with concentration and active attention. And the ratio of the two uh, is often juxtaposed in order to evaluate whether or not somebody has higher theta activity than beta and certainly more than typical people would have. So the goal here is to reward the individual through a game-like device for increasing the brain waves associated with concentration and decreasing those associated with inattention. Now, there are other protocols that focus more on sensory motor training. They're not as popular as the theta-beta training. There's some that focus only on training beta uh, and are interested just in that. Um, so the protocols are different, but it basically comes down to this. You're using a form of reinforcement learning, operant conditioning, in order to teach an individual how to alter their brain waves. Sounds exciting, but it really isn't. It was demonstrated back in the 70s that you can have people increase their brain activity associated with, in or with concentration, rather, by simply concentrating on something. So, you know, no great surprise there. Gee, if when we concentrate, we alter our brainwave activities. What was new here was that by rewarding individuals during these trials and by giving them trials every week, it could be one, two, or three, it could be 20 sessions, 30 or 40 sessions, that somehow this was going to impart 
permanent improvements in the brain's electrical activity. And so what we're here to find out is, does this work in reducing ADHD symptoms when you train individuals to alter their EEG activity in this kind of way of positively affecting attention? So uh, that's the question here before us. Now we're going to look at several reviews of the literature and see what they had to say. I've tried to pick some of the more recent reviews out there so that they've incorporated most of the research done up to the present time. So here's a review that was published back in 2019 uh, about, well, actually it was published in 2018, but didn't get into print till 2019. This is in the European Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Journal, uh, and it is a review of various studies comparing EEG to inactive controls, which means something like a weightless control group that didn't get any treatment. There were other studies that compared the biofeedback group, neurofeedback, to active controls, kids who were getting some other kind of treatment. Some involved just physical activity that was recommended. Uh, others might have involved medication. And in some of the studies, there was sham biofeedback, so that individuals didn't necessarily know, nor did those evaluating them, whether or not they got the active treatment. Uh, and then uh, finally, some of the studies, as I said, looked at whether or not adding neurofeedback to medication was uh, helped to improve the status of the treatment outcome. So here's what this study found. It found that if you just looked at the group that got neurofeedback and you measured them before treatment and after treatment, there was significant improvement in their ADHD symptoms in lab measures of inattention uh, and inhibition. Uh, on the other hand, if you looked at the control groups, they also showed improvement, though not as much as the biofeedback group. And that's very important because what it's telling you is that when you bring people into a clinic and you do anything to them, you will get improvement in their reports of ADHD symptoms from pre-test to post-test. So that's not exciting. That doesn't convince me of anything because people got better because you did something to them. More important is that, that the act of treatment do better than a control group. Well, if the control group didn't get anything, the answer seems to be yes, but not by very much. There was some significant differences here. On the other hand, if the control group was given methylphenidate, then neurofeedback was nowhere near as effective as stimulant medication. And in the few studies that used sham biofeedback, there were no differences between this placebo type of biofeedback and typical biofeedback. So uh, it just depends on how you measure it and what measures you're looking at. In most of these studies, as this review found, lab measures often found improvements in inattention and to some extent impulsivity. But as we will see later, other reviews found that if you looked at ratings of how these people were functioning out there in real life, you didn't get as much of an effect as you did on the lab measures. Now, you know from my other videos here about neuropsychological testing and ADHD that neuropsychological tests, lab tests, first of all, are not correlated with much of anything out in the real world, so we're not quite sure what they're measuring, but it's certainly not real-world ADHD symptoms. And we know that they can't be used for making a diagnosis because of that. So although it sounds impressive that some studies are finding improvement from neurofeedback on these lab measures, again, don't get so excited about that because these lab measures are not really predictive of much, if anything, going on out there in daily life. Uh, this review concludes that neurofeedback looks effective when you compare it to a no treatment control group that gets nothing, but it looks a lot less effective when you compare it to an active control group that's getting an alternative treatment like medication or a sham biofeedback treatment. So uh, that's our first review. Now let's take a look 
at another review up here. This was published uh, in Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and Mental Health. This was published uh, about a year ago in December of 2022. Uh, and it's a look at neurofeedback and sustained attention. Again, it's a meta-analysis. It's looking across different studies. It takes the best of those studies in the author's opinions and then looks at the combined effects across all of these studies. What did they find? They found that EEG neurofeedback was associated with benefits on sustained attention measures in the lab, but not on measures of selective attention or working memory, sort of other measures of executive functioning. So this review isn't looking at how people are functioning in daily life, it's looking at lab measures. And it's finding that there was some enhancement of lab measures through this kind of training of the theta-beta ratio, uh, and uh, that it appears that three sessions per week produce the best effect on these lab measures. However, as it says here, EEG biofeedback um, did not produce significant effects when people were blinded to the kind of treatment that the individual was getting. So if parents didn't know what the kids were getting, if teachers didn't know what the kids were getting, if the patients didn't know whether they were getting the real treatment or the sham treatment, the effects were not especially impressive. Uh, indeed, no significant differences there. So what are we seeing in this review? The more rigorous the study, the more active the placebo control group, the less likely one is to see effects of neurofeedback. But if all you do is look at lab measures and look before and after at neurofeedback, it looks pretty good. Now, let's go on and look at yet another review a systematic review and meta-analysis, this one focusing primarily on children, published in the journal Behavior, Cognition, Neuroscience, a journal called NeuroCase. Uh, this looked at ratings out in the real world, systematic review, randomized trials, multiple databases, looking at parent and teacher ratings, of ADHD as well as self-report ratings in some cases, but primarily parent and teacher ratings on the Connor scales and the ADHD rating scale. 17 trials were included in this review involving more than 1,200 patients. Analyses showed that there was no significant benefit of neurofeedback treatment compared with other treatments or control conditions. So once again, we see effects on lab measures, much less likely to see them out there in the real world. We see effects if there's not an active control condition, where there is an active control condition, then we're not likely to even see the lab effects. All right, here's another review. Uh, this one was uh, published in the Journal of Attention Disorders uh, in 2021, so about two years old. It was also a meta-analysis. It looked at randomized trials, and it found 10 studies that met their criteria for inclusion. And the conclusion was the effects of neurofeedback were not found on domains of executive functioning, which was the focus of this review. So lab measures of executive functioning did not seem to significantly improve here. This is in contradiction to some of the earlier meta-analyses that suggested that lab measures did show results. Now, here's another review, a meta-analysis of neurofeedback. It is comparing neurofeedback to stimulant medication. And the long and the short of it is that 18 studies were included in the meta-analysis, and what they found is that methylphenidate was significantly superior to neurofeedback on core symptoms of ADHD, whether measured by symptom ratings or whether measured by lab tests of attention and inhibition. Uh, so this review didn't find much of anything either. So that being said, uh, when I say that, I mean it wasn't as good as medication. They certainly found results, but primarily for the medication was two to three times more effective than the neurofeedback. So there you have it. We have opinions all over the map, 
going all the way back for the last 45 to 50 years, all the way back to when Joel Lubar first talked about applying neurofeedback conditioning to ADHD in children and later in adults. The sessions, we have to keep in mind, are expensive. They can run $100 or more per treatment. You're often recommended to get 40 or more treatment sessions, often several times a week. So it's an expensive intervention, particularly relative to standard treatments like medication, like behavioral parent training, like consulting to schools on classroom management. It's an expensive treatment. So should you consider neurofeedback for treatment? My view is that you should try the evidence-based treatments that we know are helpful for managing ADHD first. Then, if you're not happy with what those treatments produced and you have expendable income, don't go second mortgaging the house or taking your savings that you really need for emergencies, but if you have expendable income and you want to go out and try this treatment, then by all means, go right ahead. But it is not a first-line treatment for ADHD. It is not as effective as medication. The results certainly are not particularly convincing when we compare them in rigorous studies to sham biofeedback, other placebos, or to medication. But when we compare them to weightless controls, there does seem to be some benefit for what that's worth, and primarily the benefits are on lab measures rather than real-world ratings of ADHD. So that's my take on neurofeedback. I'm sure you have your own opinions. I'm sure I'll hear from you in the reply section if you do. Uh, but that's the status of the field, a real mixed bag of results. But in generally suggesting there isn't much here, I think, certainly not as good as medication. But if you want to try it, go ahead and give it a shot. So thanks for joining me this Halloween. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the Devil's Mask.